Marshal your box, take your time. Oh, a vine's a thought. That's interesting. That comes from a man who sort of can be said as a father of genocides in this yeah, country. I know. Do you know who wrote the vine's a thought? Go, go, go. Never see it. See it, see it. Ideally, yes, but I, as I was, I was uh, telling that in most of the time, and especially we talk about digital media, what we are doing is curation. We don't have reporters on the ground. We are not ready to invest, and that's why it is important to understand the political economy of media at large, yeah. including, say, digital media. Uh, most of the big digital media are say, owned by the same corporate organizations. Also, just to add to that, uh, while I see the value in what you're saying, as you said, a lot of it is curation. We're seeing something which is playing out on social media. We're picking up on that. But we still, for all our failures, have to verify it. There is so much false information doing the rounds that we could make things worse if we don't verify it. But I do want to say that I don't know if uh, if you mean prevent it in the sense by going there before, because it only, it, that's a very, very hard thing to happen organically, because why would uh, a reporter be in, uh, yeah, so one is that, but I get that because I actually had a little bit of that experience when the Muzaffarnagar riots happened. So uh, the first, uh, first uh, day of violence had already happened, so all of us were in uh, in Muzaffarnagar, which was under curfew, and the police had told us not to leave the, the town, uh, the press that is. And uh, through reports, we heard of a place, um, like a village outside, where there was ongoing violence. So we went there. And, uh, and it was an unfolding riot situation. But even though we were there, we could not prevent it. I mean, nobody died, but it didn't stop the people who were going to leave or, or the stone pelting that was happening, despite our camera. And uh, there was no signal, so we couldn't do lives. So I, I've been in a situation which you just described, and there was no way that we could have stopped it. We called the police who were on their way and so on, got shouted at. But So it's not the responsibility of the media to be able to prevent something. It's the state's responsibility. Right. And uh, so first, it is not the duty of the reporter to prevent. I don't think it's a duty of Ever. media to prevent. But also, those who are, who, who are present every day, not like me going Muzaffarnagar or say going somewhere. Most of the reporters who will report on these issues are, they'll be living there. They are part and parcel of the, that society. So it is unlikely that they will, they will try to prevent that. Right, that goes back to the matter of who is the reporter, yeah. who edited, which reporter is in and that we talked about. Right, yes. Let's also introduce ourselves from here. Uh, hi, my name is Sanjula. I'm a first year student for journalism school. And uh, my question is with regards to what the government has recently done um, regarding um, talking to WhatsApp about their privacy issues. Now, um, do you think um, gaming the platform is um, a viable solution to, um, to holding the increase in the mob violence? 
Well, um, I think you've already answered the question in the question, <laughs> but uh, of course not. Especially in a context when we are in increasingly fascist, surveillance-ridden regime. I can't call it a democracy, but a regime. And uh, in, that, in that context then, it's very important to weigh what preventing WhatsApp or surveilling WhatsApp would do. It gives uh, enormous powers to the government. Enormous powers. And uh, is it actually going to prevent videos from being circulated? No, of course not. You could circulate them through many other means. Did, did, these, did, did the videos not get circulated before WhatsApp came around? It's easier, but it's certainly not the only means. Uh, we need to stop uh, WhatsApp, it will go on to Snapchat, it will go to Instagram, it will go Signal, uh, Telegram. Uh, anything, there's like 150 million ways to spread videos, to spread hate. It actually goes door to door. During the partition, we didn't have TV. A million people died. A million. I'm underlining that. That's your answer. Do any of you want to no. add to that? Right, yes. Sukumar. Yeah, I kind of connected Sukumar with me. I don't mean school. I um, would like to take up a point raised by the first uh, questioner. This uh, anticipation of an event and uh, preventive uh, action. Now, obviously, uh, preventive action given the new cycle and so on, is unrealistic. But over the long term, can you, uh, long term in like a, a space of two, three days, can you think of uh, media reporting acting as a kind of break upon the, upon the. As a de-escalation. Yeah, upon the violence. And uh, a second point is, a connected point, is that, um, you know, the social media has also led to a, a loss of, uh, of identity for the traditional media. In the sense that surveys show that people get increasingly, they are getting their news from social media and they're forgetting the source. A lot of it is originating in the traditional media, but you know, so you're not, you're losing that, uh, that uh, older understanding whereby a certain uh, reader, a certain media consumer associates a certain level of credibility with a certain kind of media platform. Right. You know, for instance, he says, I saw it in the BBC, so it has to be authentic. I saw it in the Hindu, you know. They don't play around, they don't mess around with words, uh, with, uh, with the news. So they're losing that. So what gets replicated most is what is like, you know, I think yesterday there was a talk here which I couldn't attend, but the topic was uh, confirmation bias, you know, which, uh, which uh, plays to that instinct, the confirmation bias that we all, we all, we all require. So, uh, so two questions. Now, is it... Uh, Credible activity for the media, the tr traditional media, to to keep a watch on this kind of a, the, the the rumor mill that circulates in the in the social media. Uh, you can look at specific instances like Mujhafar Nagar was talked about. There was a lot of talk about how MMS yeah. images circulated, videos circulated through yeah. MMS had a kind of you know inflammatory effect. The Bangalore incident where yeah. uh, northeastern people on northeastern origin were forced to flee. You know, again, this was before WhatsApp, but uh, social media was a big player there. Uh, so, uh, and uh, most shocking, and I think Alt News did a very good analysis of this, uh, this uh, uh, the incident of December 6th in uh, Raj Samand in uh, Rajasthan. Uh, you know, the entire buzz in the, in the traditional media, in the video uh, news space, at that time was about uh, a remark that Manishankar Ayer made about the Prime Minister, you know, which is supposedly a caste slur. The entire thing was banished from news headlines. Then the accused was produced in court. There were vigilantes who kind of commandeered the court from premises, raised the flag. But this didn't get very much of play in the, you know. So, so is the traditional media kind of copping out because they can't cope with this challenge? Or is, are they safe catering to a constituency uh, that uh, you know, they're comfortable with, and this constituency doesn't want too much of this, this unpleasant stuff coming into their universe. They, you know. Okay, so one, one thing at a time then. Uh, first of all, I think the question about whether the media should play a role to de-escalate, and I think this feeds into what Neha had been talking about when she was saying the naming of communities versus the traditional. We do not name communities. We do not name them because naming them could lead to greater tensions. And so questions of what de-escalation means 
versus a new framework of saying, look, this is what is happening. Mobs are coming from a majoritarian space. How does that balancing work? Can there be active de-escalation, right? Right, I think it's a little bit of a, a task to place that responsibility on the media. Uh, I think the primary responsibility of that lies with the state and the way media can sort of come in is is to report on it as uh, as intensively and as extensively uh, and hold the state accountable for non-de-escalation or to push the state towards de-escalation rather than uh, trying to do that itself uh, by tiptoeing around the issue or saying everything is not as bad or trying to tone down their reporting. So I think uh, what actually is more important in the current context more than ever is 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 to is to take names is to say what has happened is to uh, make a larger public aware of uh, of the ground tensions uh, it may not have a healing or calming effect in in that immediate village but the responsibility has to be on the state on the local administration to make sure that the escalation happens and the responsibility of the media to make sure that the police is doing its job, the local administration is doing its job, the accused are not protected, the victims are not victimized further. So that's the way I think it can. But more than that, uh, to expect uh, it, to, it to play a larger role is, is a bit unfair. Of course, the other way to do is to also highlight like positive stories, which we often see that a Hindu man helping 200 Muslim women, or you know, stories like that, which are fine. I think they serve it, they serve their purpose and and important to report on. But the main uh, main thing has to be keeping the state in check. Right. Uh, do either of you want to add to what what Mia said? Or we move on to the next two parts of the common question. Yes. The mm -hmm. next part. I want to uh, go, 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 go. You know the bit about. Uh, the bit, the, quest, the bit that you asked about WhatsApp and the social media. Uh, can you just phrase it again a little bit? Well, it's it just that, you know, the... Uh, yeah, the loss of the identity. Of the <laughs> Confirmation, yeah, exactly. No, there is a relationship of trust that you yeah, should exist. Yeah. No, you now, read the newspaper, you I think there are two things. The yeah. trust is eroded partly because the mainstream media has failed people and failed to actually gauge who the people are and how to build that trust with them in various ways. But there's also an agenda playing there. Once the media started to fail slightly, the state stepped in and made it fail spectacularly by promoting this idea that the mainstream media is rubbish. Because you will see this happen in, in, in all fascist states. Trump rubbishes the media all the time. Erdogan does it in Turkey. Modi does it here. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I don't know, he, he has, he actually has worked, no, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, like, he has actually worked very hard on this, very hard on some underlying that. He has actually done something that it, it's insidious, we, we take it for granted that this is just the way it is. Can I just but it's been built into the framework by, adding, by creating a troll army, by, by, by making those people sort of uh, unleash such large volumes of misinformation and false news, that it actually crowds the space and you end up discussing this and trying to but figure out. Just, I want to ask yeah. you something which will just take this forward, which is that all of this is absolutely true, yeah. but the point is that unlike Erdogan in Turkey, where there had to be an actual crackdown, yeah. here you now go to jail. Yes, so your newspaper will be shut down. It was very much a sort of yeah, emergency yeah. style crackdown, yeah. which was met with a resistance. Here, everyone seems to sort of curl up and give way. Yes, so there's a, I think the the that's why I'm saying. So I, I think that the way I process this is that uh, the previous generation, uh, say people who were uh, journalists in the 70s and 80s, were more uh, comfortable in their, uh, financially. So they came from, largely from, at least in the English media, they came from, in, even to some extent, I don't know how far this goes, my assessment of the, the, at least the mainstream Hindi media also, that this is, they were from upper middle class families. So they weren't, they, they were literally the Jholawalas, people who said, I don't want a big salary. And uh, they weren't very, the economy was closed. So you didn't actually need to earn very much money to live. And you, did, you couldn't go and buy those Nike shoes, you couldn't buy a flat screen TV because it didn't exist. Now you want to send your children to world schools and you want the EMI to get those flats. 
So you are much more vulnerable as middle middle class people and those are the people in the media. So either you have to make a choice between saying, oh my children should will go to a government school and I will be out on the road without a job. These are very real choices that we've had to make. And uh, I, for instance, have had to make this very real choice in the last four years because I'm writing a book which goes straight up against current administration. I'm completely broke, broke living off my mother. I had to crowdfund to get the money to finish writing the book because no institutional funding was available. They all shut their doors. I can name them if you like. But I'm saying that, so it's a hard choice to make. I don't have children, so it's, it's, easy, it's easier for me to take that risk, but not everybody can do that. And it's not fair to expect people to have to do that. So if a, if, if a journalist wants a regular middle class life, which in today's terms means a small to middling sized car, a flat for which they have to put EMIs down for 20 years, that means they can't afford to lose their job in year two or year three, because then they're basically literally fucked. Fair enough. All right, uh, yes. Yeah, my question is specific to Vedic Sheet. Um, you mentioned that you feel that the three or four people in Gujarat. I spent three years living with them, and my book is based on the lives of these three people who were part of the mob. My question is, uh, you mentioned that one has turned around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, no, I can talk about it, but you'll have to stop me somewhere because this is the whole subject of the book. I am here. I will stop you. Go. <laughs> so there's three people. The one who turned uh, around was someone who was at the edge of the mob in 2003, in the sense that he didn't actually kill people or rape women like others did, but he he was a student doing a master's in the liberal arts, and so you know, uh, he went around, uh, classes were disrupted because there were riots, so he went around with his uh, friends saying, oh, let's check out which Muslim shop uh, has been abandoned, let's loot some Bata shoes from there. So he was a warrior. He wasn't actually someone who got his hands dirty in the, in the, in the main in the extreme sense of the term, but he was at the edge of the mob. But he hated Muslims, and he said, yeah, you know, when, when Gujarat was divided in two parts, he said, I'll, I'll read in Hindi first and then in English. He said, Gujarat was in two parts. Those people who were out celebrating and, 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 and people who were in the middle of the Those people who were out celebrating and people who were killing. And he said, I was part of the celebrating people. I was in the middle of the Jashan. When the riots were over, he was trying to get a job. His master's is finished. Uh, where did he look to work? Now Gujarat had had this huge earthquake in Kutch the previous year, so there was massive money coming into the development sector. And in the following year, in 2002, there was money coming in now for the, the riot relief since the government had abdicated that responsibility completely. So where does this man who's gone out cheering for the death and destruction of Muslims find a job? In an NGO that is rehabilitating them. Now, the thing with this man's story that surprised me and shocked me and changed everything I know about violence ever since uh, is that I did not expect this. I did not expect to encounter someone whose now whole, his entire world has changed. He's gone from being someone who hated Muslims, who grew up on a diet of hate like many people in the Hindu middle class, from a small town and a, and a village actually. Then his work, his entire workspace becomes Muslim. So suddenly he's confronted with meeting actual Muslims that are not like the imagined abominable people that he thought they were. And it disturbed him. He couldn't sleep. He did not know how to deal with it. It took him the next few years to realize that actually he was the abominable person. But by that time, he was alienated from everyone He, he in his head. He was distributing relief and rehabilitation while not knowing who he was anymore. And there was nothing in his environment for, him to turn, for no one to him to turn to. So he alienated himself from his family. And he couldn't deal with his friends who were all part of the VHP. And he couldn't deal with the development sector, assuming that he's liberal, whereas he'd come from a non-liberal space. And he was trying to understand what liberal means. It's like uh, being airdropped into Poland and not knowing how to speak the language. You know? Liberalism is another language. He didn't understand it. He had to teach himself to it. Meanwhile, he was, he was talking in gibberish, basically. So his journey of transformation told me that we have not understood, actually, that violence can change. 
And that is where we also are spectacularly failing as media. We, we are not willing to crash beneath the surface, spend time with perpetrators and understand that space. We're willing, we're so comfortable saying, oh, this man, this is someone who's done me this. Fix, finish, close the box, look at the next slide. That's one part of the story. You wanted to know the other side? Yeah. How you different from the other? My other character is the other darkest extreme is a man called Suresh Richard who, who came from a part of Ahmedabad which saw the worst massacre in 2002 where 97 people were killed on one street called Naroda Patia. It was called the Naroda Patia case. Because Naroda Patia was one side of the road the, where Muslims lived. The other side was another ghetto of people called the Tharas. Now the Tharas are a denotified criminal tribe. They were criminalized in 1871, two decades after the 1857 revolt. And in that revolt, basically the British were so scared of not being able to account for people and ex expecting another rebellion, that they put 100 and, I forget the number, 82 I think, nomadic tribes into little dabbas and they signed them and said you cannot leave. So the Tharas were one of those nomadic tribes that was consigned to these internment camps. So their nomad, nomad live off movement. So their economic system was crushed and they were living in these internment camps. And uh, the Criminal Tribes Act states that if you belong to one of these tribes, at birth, the baby is a criminal for belonging to that tribe. So if you, therefore, if, if we are all Tharas in this room, and I've uh, borrowed 10 lakh rupees from you, I borrowed 10 lakh rupees from you and I don't feel like returning it. You can't go to the cops. Because why did you lend money to a group? No, because we are all criminals. We are all charas. So I can't turn to the system because the system doesn't exist for me. Even now? No. But I am coming to that. Yeah. So if the system doesn't exist for me, then I become a criminal. Mm. And then I have these gundas who protect me. So if I am like this strong person, I will say, you don't return Kajori 10 lakhs, I will sit on you. I will beat you to pulp. I will break your leg. But after independence, in fact, the, these criminal tribes were, continued to be criminals for another six years. They celebrate a different day as independence, saying that we were still prisoners of the system because the system didn't even know that we were prisoners of the system for six years after independence. When they became, when they became decriminalized, so they're not denotified criminal tribes, the structural violence of the system not existing for them continued. So they continue to be left out of schools, education institutions, no drainage, no jobs, no nothing. So by the time Suresh comes around in 2002, there are three generations who take pride in being criminals. If you haven't been to jail a few times, no one will marry your daughter. You know? Uh, they take pride in being outlaws. So there's a certain amount of violence that's normalized in that society because we have spectacularly failed them. That's what I'm saying. When we don't look at the Spaces that this mob violence comes from, we fail, fail spectacularly. There's another part of the story. Why did Suresh's brother not do what he did? I'll tell you what Suresh did in 2002. He cut open the fetus of a pregnant woman and dashed it to pieces. He raped and killed many women. He bragged about it later in a sting operation to say, Mene Musulman orto ka is prakar balatkar kiya ki wo achar ban gaye. You can Google these sting tapes that the Halka put out there. Why did he brag? Because mob violence, as opposed to hate crimes, is about creating a political space where you feel as a criminal tribe, as someone, you feel you don't have an identity. This gives you something to feel proud of because it existed in an environment where hate was being enabled by the BJP, by the BHP, by the RSS and the Badgam Dal from the time of the destruction of the Babri Masjid in 1992 till 2002. So for 10 years, they have been preying on people like Suresh. And Suresh is a protector of all the other people in the Chara who say, oh, you know, my money was stuck. This guy helped me. So if you're under his protectorate, actually, that's a good thing. So he is now upping his stakes and becoming an even bigger protector of Hindu pride, which is an, an enabler for him, which is why he bragged about this on tape, which is what has sent him to prison now for 31 years. While he was doing all of this, he's married to a Muslim woman. <coughs> the point I'm trying to make with all of this is not just to shock you. It's to try and tell you that we do not understand violence. 
We do not understand mass violence and we have not even tried to get inside the heads of these people. Why did he marry a Muslim woman? Because around the time that he was being Hinduized by the Bajrangas, his sister ran away with a Muslim man and he lost with a Muslim man. So he said, Achha, unhone mere kaum me se ek liya, main unke kaum me se ek lunga. He went about saying, I'm going to get a Muslim woman because my sister ran away with a Muslim man. Because women are property in this state. The difference between Suresh and my other character is that that character is upper caste, enabled. He was at the edge of the mob. He had the means and the education. He finished a master's. Even, even then, he was not spared from the idea of a Hindu identity which is so all-pervasive across the middle class. But for Suresh, he comes from a state where it's impossible to escape this. There's a third part of it. Why Suresh and why not someone else? Why not his brother, for instance? Because Suresh also was the elder, eldest of, uh, the, of the brothers and sisters in his family, but he grew up with polio, so he had a bad leg. So his father went and did this herbal remedy, which is current uh, prevalent among Sharas, which is that you, you bathe the bad leg Polio leads to muscular dystrophy, so he couldn't walk. He had a bad leg. So his father did what the other everyone else in the community does, which is you basically kill a pigeon and you bathe the leg in the blood of a fresh pigeon. This is a this is a remedy. You can Google it. A lot of the distressed blood apparently has properties in it which can help repair a bad muscle. So he set a trap in the well of the in the street where he lived and um, trapped some pigeons. But the pigeons, uh, the pigeons uh, basically, he went, he went to collect them, he put this trap there, he fell into the well. So the skin got scalded off the father's leg. So he cursed his son and he said, this, this son of mine is not my son. This is what he used to say about his son, he disowned his son. So this is what Suresh grew up with. The environment was one of violence. His own personal story was one of hate and violence, and so he started to externalize right. it in many small ways, in many ways. So now it's a very long right. answer, but did uh, you get the answer? Okay, okay. so now uh, I think we just want to wrap up, give you guys a chance to make some final comments. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, there were so many things that I have time with you after the panel as well, so we can continue this. But I, you, you guys did talk about reportage. You spent some time talking about even the political economy of how that reporting happens. But what about internal diversity within media houses? So apart from larger economic pressures on the editorial side, what is what is happening at the editorial side apart from that? I think we have just for the for the non-journalists, we've just recovered from a series of sting operations that didn't figure. Uh, in the conversation. So perhaps while you're wrapping up, also talk about ideologically driven, very political editorial sites. And within that, are there stories where there is resistance among journalists within the hierarchical system? Yeah. Absolutely. Sure, very much. Ridden so. with it. Ridden yeah. with it. Ridden with it. <laughs> it's ridden with it, but I've seen Huffington Post, the, 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 the recent the new editor, Amal mm -hmm. Sethi, actually put out an ad saying, that he wants someone to cover um, uh, social distanciation specifically, and he specifically is looking for a Dalit. So that, as to me, was such a happy day yeah. to see that Aman could do that as the editor of, of Half Post, you know. Uh, so there are people who are saying, okay, we don't have Dalits in the newsroom. Do we have tribals? No, we haven't even begun a conversation on that, but we started with Dalits. I mean, I did bring it up, and then the conversation about sort of social media took over, but has it been a problem? Yes. Have there been people who've been saying that, that this needs to be remedied? Yes. But the fact that newsrooms are traditional newsrooms in particular, even most non-traditional newsrooms, um, including The Wire, are headed by <coughs> upper caste Hindu men is just a fact. And upper class Hindu men, by and large, don't like to disturb the status quo. They will, they will hire maybe a couple of people to make the place look good, but by and large, they don't push the envelope. Is that changing? I think it is. I think your your example of is a good one, and I think there is a a movement towards it. But tip of the iceberg. Dalit camera which exists in uh, Tamil Nadu. Excellent. 
It's a charity. It's, it's, it's a video news service run by Dalit women. Yeah. Khabar area. It's it's Dalit women. Khabar area. So there are, as Neha was saying, because this internet space is yeah. so wa- vast, it allows places like this to exist. Yeah. I have a slightly <laughs> different take on this. While I feel that representation is very important, what we do, do not talk about is what I also see in every, I mean, at the bottom of the application that women, minority, will be given priority or say are encouraged to apply. All these things are there. But my, my, uh, so hiring, what, our approach towards diversity, diversity is, is being very problematic. Mm. Is we feel that we will have three women, two tribals, that kind of thing, that representation, yeah. and that's that, and that's done. Mm. No, the thing is how we are going, how we are treating the diverse group of people. Of I don't think we have even started that that this uh, conversation, uh, uh, conversation. Mm. and that's why we see that people are joining from underprivileged historically discriminated uh, background but they leave after yeah. three months yeah. and that's why we often hear that oh but these are not comforting people i think you're absolutely correct for that and i i would just like to build up on that if when i say that i have that, <coughs> that editors in particular in the lower levels you will find people from from other communities I've never met one of the editorial level in Delhi Press, certainly, or in West Bengal, which are the two I know best. Uh, I have met Muslim editors, yeah. several Muslim editors, and I'll tell you why. It's because the that journalistic capital even today exists on contacts. Who has contact? Other caste people and the old Muslim elite. That is where your so the more contact you have, the more stories you're breaking, the more stories you're breaking, the quicker you get promoted. There you go. You're not going to get access to corridors of power if you don't have that, and that's just been a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to say something similar that how are we getting the jobs is the question. Yeah. Uh, it's because I know someone, not because there is an application process. Most places don't have an application process. Most places fill their vacancies by word of mouth or through references. So very few places open an application process, which means that if I don't know anyone, then I will literally have to rely on the two, three places that are putting out a call. Otherwise, I will have to cold uh, email like the <coughs> editors with my CV and hope they will respond. So the problem is, is before even who the applicant is, but that how the applicant is approaching the organization. Right. So, shall we have? Yes. While the news media itself is propagated as paid media or paid media, so how, as a journalist, the credibility of news media could be saved in growing ages? You know, Prem, I think that's that's what Professor Sukumar had just asked. So, and I think to a degree that has been answered. Why don't we continue this conversation after we we, we close this? Uh, Meta, closing remarks. <coughs> yeah, closing um, remarks. I would say that since this is a gathering of both law and journalism students, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, it would be really like nice because you both have access to different centers to be able to uh, uh, to take this conversation forward by, uh, for instance, the law students. I mean, you have a hate crime clinic, so I'm guessing a lot of the work that you're doing is looking at those cases, looking at the documents, uh, trying to find uh, what were the problems in the cases, why the case is falling apart, why has one case done better than the other. Uh, so information like that, which which can then be shared with the journalism students who can actually uh, you know, utilize it in their assignments or to, to even write about it. Because uh, the legal uh, understanding of journalists is very poor apart from the few legal reporters. Even that I'm not very sure. So that's something that journalism students can greatly benefit by being, uh, you know, if, if this is an area of interest or whatever else, I mean, you know, law is in all, all spaces. So that I think would be very useful. 
uh, and for the law students to create some kind of like a framework or like what are the things that journalists should be looking at, uh, uh, whether it's a hate crime, how is it in different countries, uh, you know, just like advanced knowledge on that because you have a space which is uh, specifically dealing with this issue. And that can be useful not just for the students here, but uh, you can put it out publicly for yeah. for the larger media fraternity and, and that would be uh, very helpful. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Drifti, uh, Mehta, Neha, thank you for joining us today and coming down. Wasn't thank you for putting it together.